welcome to hello and welcome to the next to the session of the CPRA Law and Tech series presented by the Future of Privacy Forum and the Privacy Law Section of the California Lawyers Association. Um, we're so happy to welcome you today. Um, this session will be about sensitive personal information. And um, just a little bit about who we are. Uh, the co-hosts are, as I said earlier, the Future of Privacy Forum, um, a, a policymaking or entity um, focusing on privacy issues and the California Lawyers Association's privacy law section. We are really the state bar of California. Um, I am Sherry Porath Rockwell. I'm a privacy lawyer at Sidley Austin and I'm the chair of the California Lawyers Association. And I am hosting this with Stacy Gray, um, who I will turn it over to briefly um, from the Future of Privacy Forum. Thanks, Sherry. I'm Stacy Gray. Uh, as she said, I'm the Director of Legislative Research and Analysis at the Future of Privacy Forum, where we're a Washington DC based, but also global nonprofit organization focused on consumer privacy. And a quick a bit about this series before we introduce the rest of our, our excellent speakers for today. This is a Law Plus Tech series that we're hosting every Friday from now through end of March. Uh, and maybe a little bit beyond that, each lunchtime afternoon, noon Pacific time. And each week we're gonna be focusing on a different substantive topic that is technological or business practice related in nature. And we're gonna be focusing primarily on the business practices or the technology with a little bit of introduction in the beginning to why we're talking about it, which is the law, um, the California Privacy Rights Act, which was passed and will come into effect next year, as well as other uh, emerging legislation that is making this kind of information critical to understand for, for privacy lawyers. So today is the session on sensitive data. We're gonna be focusing specifically on health conditions, uh, but of course, sensitive data includes other things as well. And join us as well by registering at fpf.org slash events for future series on online advertising, dark patterns, manipulative design, and universal opt-outs. Uh, and let me let me turn it actually back over to you, Sherry, for, for the purpose of introducing our speakers. Okay, and then before I do that, just a couple housekeeping notes. One is um, we may have time for questions, so you can post your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And also just wanted to let everybody know that we are recording this today. All right, and with that, I will introduce our speakers. We have um, Rob Tekoyan. Rob works in the business and finance group at Fenimore with a particular focus on healthcare and privacy. And much of his work encompasses counseling healthcare providers regarding HIPAA, the Stark Law, and the corporate practice of medicine. We also are, have Kate Black joining us. Kate is a partner at Hints Law, and she's formerly the Global Privacy Officer for 23andMe, and previously served at the US HHS's Office of National Coordinator for Health IT. And we also have Charlene Ho. She is a partner at Perkins Coy, and she provides um, strategic advice to all kinds of tech companies. Um, including on issues relating to artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, digital identity, and extended reality, and all manner of things. Um, she serves as the co-lead of the firm's immersive technology vertical, leads the firm's technology transactions and privacy practices innovation committee, and is a founding member of the Privacy Compass team. And with that, I will turn it back over to Stacy. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sherry. All right. So um, like we said, we will be taking questions both throughout and at the end with some dedicated time set aside for discussion and questions. Lots of time, in fact. So we're really looking forward to your questions in the Q&A feature. Um, today's agenda, we're going to run for roughly an hour and then have the following 15 minutes set aside, maybe a little shorter than that. We're going to talk first at a high level about what this concept is that we're talking about when we talk about sensitive data or sensitive personal information or sensitive information. 
we'll preview some of the emerging legislative definitions and requirements, mostly to put this into context about why it is we're talking about this and what the, what the scope of data is that we're discussing. Um, so we'll, in that framing, we'll talk a little bit about what non-HIPAA health data means, for example. And as a couple of case studies, we thought that we would focus today on a specific category of sensitive data that relates to non-HIPAA health, fitness, and wellness information. Data that falls outside of HIPAA or in CMIA, and we'll talk about what that means, um, but is still related to consumer health. And we'll, we're going to specifically talk through two case studies on that, one related to at-home diagnostic testing, spit tests, and similar testing uh, services for consumers, and one related to mobile apps. And then, then we'll have some more discussion around that. Uh, so with that, let's, uh, let's kick it off. We're going to start with you, Charlene, to talk us through what this concept is. What is sensitive data? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the definition of sensitive data as shown in this diagram is that it, it is a subset of personal information. So personal information broadly is information relating to an identified or identifiable person such as contact name, IP address, advertising ID or public records. And Whereas non-PI on the right-hand side is information that's unrelated to persons such as machine data, although I will say that recently we've seen movement in the EU to try to have regulations and there are existing regulations on non-personal data. And the definition of personal data is very broad, so it's quite difficult to argue sometimes that something is non-personal. Other types of non-personal data are data related to groups that don't specifically identify individuals or are sufficiently aggregated or anonymized, such as statistics. So going to the middle of the slide, sensitive PI is somewhere in between. Um, it, is, it is personal information, and it's personal information that carries heightened risks related to threats, harms, or impacts on private life. And some examples are health records, financial information, race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, religious beliefs, communications, and biometrics. Back to you, Stacey. Thanks, Sherlyn. Um, so actually, I'm going to return to that slide for just a moment, uh, if I can. And I'll just remind everyone, since we're now a minute in, a couple of minutes in, that we are taking questions in the Q&A feature. So just put your questions there. We don't have a, an open chat today, but you can also message us directly. But the Q&A feature is the way to do it. And we will be circulating this recording and slides um, after the webinar. So folks who are looking for a copy of the slides will be sending those out afterwards. So having looked a little bit at, at where you know, what, what it means um, for data to be considered sensitive because it's particularly high risk, impacts a vulnerable population, uh, or, or it's considered particularly impactful for private life or privacy. Um, there's also some historical coincidence that has come with the emergence of these categories. So for instance, sensitive PI related to children is governed under a sectoral law in the United States. And this is the case with many categories of sensitive information, like health records and financial information, which we've listed, which was listed here. Uh, but the categories are emerging uh, in new legislation as well. So we have this very busy chart that I'm not, you know, going to read, but, uh, but yes, we will be circulating this afterwards. Um, showing you some of the variety in how sensitive data is beginning to be defined in emerging laws. So, so far, the California Privacy Rights Act, the Virginia Consumer Data Protection Act, the Colorado Privacy Act are three U.S. state laws that have been passed <clears throat> into law but will not come into effect until 2023. And each of them has some kind of heightened or different protection for sensitive information. However, what information is categorized as sensitive is uh, different under each law. So we've started on the left-hand side with the California, California Privacy Rights Act and all of the different categories that it includes. Um, many of these largely track to the European Data Protection Regulation and some of the categories at the bottom that it doesn't include. Uh, for instance, 
political opinion is one that is not included in any US state law so far, even though it is included in the GDPR. And you can see that this differs uh, from Virginia and Colorado in a couple of in a couple of key ways. The main way being that Virginia and Colorado uh, do not include some of the information that is included in California, um, <clears throat> such as you know government IDs, union membership is an interesting one, and contents of communication. Precise geolocation data is probably the other one to point out that uh, is different between these three states in that it's been left out um, in Colorado. And the other thing, if you focus your attention to the far left-hand side of this table, um, the other thing that we may get into a little bit in terms of interpreting these new statutes is that the phrasing of how, how these categories are defined differs by different parts of the definition. So, the information in the first bucket from social security number and government ID all the way down to genetic data is described as personal information that reveals any of these categories. Whereas biometric data, health and sexual orientation or sex life, depending on the statute, are freestanding definitions. It's not information that reveals, it's just the biometric data. It's just information related to health or sexual orientation. So something, something to, uh, to notice in those definitions and it tracks in the other states as well. The legal requirements vary. So we're not gonna deep dive into CPRA today, but in general, where you see a privacy law that treats sensitive data differently, um, typically it treats data, sensitive data differently in one of the following ways from the least to perhaps the most restrictive. You have, for instance, additional notice or disclosure requirements like we see in California. Uh, you have a requirement to limit the use or disclosure or an opt out based standard like we also see in California. Uh, other, other regimes um, require that affirmative consent be granted prior to collection of the data. So an opt-in standard rather than an opt-out all the way over to what might be one of the more restrictive uh, regimes, which is the GDPR, which requires um, in most cases, explicit consent, which is a higher standard than, than opt-in even. Um, and there are many exemptions to that, even under the GDPR. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but this is some, some of the variety. And one that I skipped is reasonable security standards. It's just worth pausing and noting that to the extent that privacy regulation tends to also mandate reasonable security practices, um, the sensitivity or the nature of the data is typically considered a strong factor in what kinds of security practices are considered reasonable with respect to that that data. And so, so sensitive data, because it's a higher risk, because it might be you know, more subject to external threats um, or more sensitive in general for individuals or more impactful if it's released, should be, should be secured uh, in better ways than other data. And this is spelled out in some laws and not others. While we're on this, we've got a couple of questions, which I'm happy to take now um, between you and me, Sherlyn, before we move on, because they, they relate to some of the categories we were just talking about. Um, one person says, I've seen social security number placed in either personal information or sensitive. And this is sometimes confusing because uh, at least in the United States, the social security number is directly tied to a specific person. Is one of the, but it's also one of the leading identifiers for financial purposes. Yeah, how would you clarify this? Well, it, it just depends on the jurisdiction, I'd say. Sherlyn, is there anything you want to add there? The only, the only thing I will add in response to this question is, though, it's, it's not always the case to think of data as either sensitive or just PI. All, all sensitive data is also PI. Yeah, that's pretty much exa exactly what I was going to say, Stacy, and that's the reason I explain that sensitive PI is a subset of PI. So whenever you have sensitive PI, it necessarily is a smaller uh, grouping under the umbrella of personal information. And I think um, the question though, however, highlights the breadth of the definition of sensitive information and the fact that it is a new term that's been introduced in CPRA. Although, you know, as Stacy had mentioned, Article 9 of GDPR already was a forerunner and many of these other laws in, in the United States model. But nonetheless, in the U.S., it's a bit different than how we've been used to treating 
things that we typically use as identifiers. So maybe prompting a move towards um, decentralized identifiers or rotating identifiers that are not static, like a social security number or identifiers that don't actually uniquely identify you as a person, but uniquely identify something about you that allows for you to be verified as who you say you are for like KYC purposes, for example. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. And the other question that we have related to just personal information generally is one one attendee asks, essentially, why is personal data defined so broadly under the GDPR? It, it does it have to do with the fact that people could be identified indirectly through indirect identifiers? I would say that I can't attest to why the GDPR was drafted the way it was exactly, but I do know that the spirit and intent of the GDPR, as well as frankly, the you know privacy laws in the US are to recognize in those jurisdictions, the fundamental human right to privacy. So therefore, if the definition of personal information or personal data is narrowly drafted, I believe that the creators of the legislation thought that that would create incentives to work around the definition. Whereas with the breadth of having it be directly identifiable or indirectly identifiable um, data, including data that's pseudonymous, meaning it's not identifiable to a person on its face, but with the combination of other information could identify a person. I think that's intended to achieve the spirit and intent of the legislation, generally speaking. Thanks. That's that's very helpful, folks. Keep the questions coming. This is great. Um, and I did have one person who who specifically just to go back to the slide for a brief second is very interested in talking a little bit more about that word reveals. And I know we're going to towards the end of this webinar. So I just want to flag it. That's yes, we agree. That's a very influential kind of concept. The the idea of revealing information. So. Okay, and we also promised you a summary of the new requirements, uh, specifically what they are. We talked what the definitions are. Now these are this is a high level summary of what the new requirements are. So once the data mapping has occurred and you've identified that the information is in fact sensitive, these are um, these are the requirements. So in it, under California, it's the right to direct a business to limit the use and disclosure of sensitive PI to that which is necessary to perform services or the goods reasonably expected by an average consumer. Um, all of this will be subject to, to, to further rulemaking from the agency, of course, right? So, um, but there are specific things in the statute about what this means, things that are considered acceptable services. Um, sensitive personal information that's collected or processed without the purpose of inferring those characteristics. Uh, is not subject to this section, but it's worth noting that in the regulatory rulemaking uh, section, the agency is tasked with specifically crafting rules around this to make sure that that's not used for purposes of evading the statute. Heightened security requirements, like I mentioned, new disclosure requirements, like I mentioned, versus in Virginia and Colorado, there's a different, there's a higher standard related to affirmative opt-in consent. And caveat that all three of these laws are subject to varying exemptions. Uh, so, so keeping it high level, Charlene, is there anything that you would add about the new requirements? No, I think you've covered it. And, uh, in the interest of time, we may, um, discuss some of these later on and kind of come back in a more fulsome way on these requirements. Yes, I, I agree. Let's, uh, let's move right along and talk about our, our main focus today, which is we're going to dive into some case studies around non-HIPAA health, fitness, wellness data. And to start us off, um, Rob, you're going to kick us off with an introduction about what we mean when we say non-HIPAA, non-CMIA. Yeah, I'll kind of give you a, a high overview of, of, of the subset of sensitive information, which, which um, entails health, health information. So, um, so HIPAA, most people or a lot of people identify HIPAA as, as, a, as, as strictly a privacy rule, but really the background is... Um, it was, it was created to actually simplify the portability of health insurance um, and prohibit discrimination uh, for benefits el eligibility and premium. So it had to do really with, with health insurance. Um, the, the Congress realized that um, in order to make health insurance portable, they had to take privacy into account, but it was almost like an afterthought. Um, it, wasn't, it was not a focus. Privacy, privacy was not a focus of the original HIPAA um, legislation. Um, 
So uh, Department of Health and Human Services is the uh, regulatory agency that, that oversees HIPAA compliance. And they, over the course of years, um, developed privacy regulations related to health information. Um, so so um, it actually, so I guess let's just start. So, so what, what's protected? So under HIPAA, Protected health information um, is individually identifiable health information that's held or transmitted by a covered entity or its business associate um, in any form of media, which would include electronic, paper, or oral. Um, this is so. Uh, this is called PHI for short. Um, so first, you have to look at what's individually identifiable. Um, so. Uh, the, in order, well, I guess start with health, what's considered health information. So first, it has to do with, it has to uh, have to do with the patient's past, present, or future physical or mental health or condition, um, or the provision of health care to the individual, or the past, present, or, or future payment for the provision of health care. Um, so that's what, that's what's considered health care under, or health, health information under HIPAA. Um, and then secondly, it has to identify the individual or have a reasonable basis for identifying an individual. So that's, that's the individually identifiable health information under HIPAA. Um, it's, so it's, it's not only limited to provider medical records. It, it's, and, uh, so it, it, it's anything that, again, that is used or transmitted by a, by a covered entity. And we'll get into that with a slide. Um, uh, related to a, a patient. Um, HIPAA does not apply to de-identified health information. Uh, so the de-identified standards are, are kind of prevalent along, along a lot of privacy regimes. And specifically in HIPAA, there's, there are two ways of de-identifying information. One is to actually get a formal determ determination from a statistician that the information is now considered de-identified. It can't be re uh, re-identified, um, or there's a list of uh, 17 or 18 different, um, I guess, uh, specified identifiers that if you remove those from what would otherwise be considered PHI, it will no longer, that information will no longer be considered PHI. Um, so uh, HIPAA applies to covered entities, as it says here, so covered entities, are, are limited to health plans, healthcare providers that engage, only engage in certain transactions and healthcare clearinghouses. So it's, it's not applicable to any, any uh, entity that, that obtains or maintains health um, information. It's only these, these specific, it's gotta be um, used or, or, or provided by these specific covered entities. Health plans are pretty self-explanatory. Health providers are typically physicians or other, um, Health providers, but notice that it has to, to do with um, electronic transactions. So the the in order to be a healthcare provider that's covered under, under HIPAA, you have to either bill or invoice or perform certain um, transactions using electronic form, means. So if you have a physician that bills everything and does all um, their uh, eligibility on paper, they may not be considered a covered entity, so they may not fall under HIPAA. Um, a business associate is, is any entity that provides uh, services to covered entities where the services involve the use or disclosure of PHI. Uh, the, and the business associate is limited to only disclosing any PHI in the same manner that a covered entity would be able to. So basically they can only do what the covered entity could do. They can't use any, any PHI outside of, of that. And usually a business associate agreement is, is uh, the document that's used to control that use of the information. And it also goes downstream to a business associates um, contractor as well. So if, they, so if they subcontract out services, they'll also typically be controlled by under HIPAA. Um, next slide, I think. So yeah, so how can, how can, so if you've got information that's considered PHI, how, how can it be used? Um, so a big purpose of, the, of the, the HIPAA privacy rule is to regulate how, how the PHI can be used. Um, 
Uh, so it can only be used as allowed under the privacy rule or more kind of probably more typically as the covered person that the patient um, allows in writing for for the uh, for the covered entity to use or the BA business associate to use the the information. So a lot of times you'll people so if you want to disclose the information, most usually um, you'll get a patient authorization to disclose the information. Um, the instances in which a covered entity or business associate or covered entity um, does not need authorization. And the main one, the one you typically see is for the treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. So physician to physician for treatment of the patient, payment if um, a, a physician is submitting a claim for payment. Those are um, instances in which you don't need um, the specific uh, agreement from the patient in writing to allow those to occur. Um, and there are also some subsets, including uh, public interest and benefit activities, and, and then some data sets for research, public health and healthcare operations. Those are um, much more limited in scope. So primarily you see them, you see disclosure of the, of the PHI for treatment and payment and healthcare operations. Um, so uh, next slide, yeah. Uh, so under, under HIPAA, so he, and this is kind of an overlying theme, HIPAA doesn't actually typically call out sensitive information. So under HIPAA, um, you've got all healthcare information is, treat, is treated pretty much similarly, um, save for psychotherapy notes, which, which is, a, is kind of a distinct area. What does happen is, is most, many state laws regulate um, specific sensitive healthcare information differently. So um, in, in the in case of California, the Confidentiality of Medical Information Act is, a, is, a, is, a, is typically um, governs, it actually predates HIPAA. Um, so under, under a, a, Cal, a CMIA or any state law and uh, HIPAA analysis, whichever uh, structure is more restrictive is the one that needs to be followed. Um, so, uh, for instance, you know, HIPAA doesn't re re uh, regulate or have a different impact on, on HIV or AIDS, um, communicable diseases, but CMIA would. So uh, you'd follow, so, so there would there'd be more restrictions based on CMIA. Um, so under uh, the CMIA, uh, it's broader, also it brings in, uh, because it's it's any provider of healthcare, it's not a healthcare provider, which is a, seems like a, a small but meaningful distinction. It also brings in some of the um, things we'll be talking about later, which are the um, the different um, remote, uh, especially technological uses of um, healthcare applications, which under HIPAA, it, they may not, may not be be covered, but under CMA, CMIA many software and hardware and, and apps designed for medical information that um, will be covered. Whereas it, under HIPAA, typically you'd have to have the, the, the covered entity um, basically uh, require or, 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 or request the use of that application to have it fall under HIPAA. So CMIA is, is typically what you'll see um, regulating that. Um, So um, let's see. Under so CMI, CMIA applies to any business organized for the purpose of maintaining the medical information to make the information available to a patient or a healthcare provider um, to allow the patient to manage his own medical information or diagnosis. Um, again, I mentioned the CMIA does apply to, to certain sensitive information that, that may not be fall under HIPAA, um, including mental health care information, which is broader than psychotherapy notes um, that, that is covered under HIPAA, um, genetic data, drug and alcohol treatment records, whereas under, although, HIP, under, although HIPAA doesn't necessarily re, uh, regulate drug and alcohol, 
there are other federal laws that do. Um, so basically, I, I guess I'm kind of out of time here. As I mentioned earlier, the, the key really is to look at whatever the regimes that are that, that have effect uh, in the jurisdiction and go with what the most restrictive. Um, so I guess that, that's it. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, we'll bring you back at the end of, for part of the discussion as well, but this is a very, very helpful overview of HIPAA and CMIA so that we can then talk about non-HIPAA and non-CMIA and, and where we're at. Um, one of the questions in the chat asks about what you just spoke to a little very briefly about cataloging health data as part of an initial security and privacy inventory, does it need to be done on a per state basis? I mean- On a what basis? On, first... per, on a per state basis. Uh, so if you, well, if you're, if you have, I guess if, if it is a question, if you if there's, you have healthcare information for individuals in that reside in different states, you're gonna have to look at each state's um, laws. As far as HIPAA goes, you definitely need to know the workflow of where health information is, mm -hmm. is taken in, uh, where it resides, and then who it's distributed to. So there, so a, a, like in, mo in most privacy areas, uh, you need to know the data flow. Um, I, I'm not sure if that answered the question with regard to um, the different state. Um, I, th I think with respect to healthcare regulation, very wise, um, with respect to non-HIPAA health related information, I'll just add that yes, the, the, the requirements do vary by state and so it's worth being aware of that. And it's strategically, it's just something you would wanna get advice on on whether it's better to do that per state or go up to the most restrictive uh, version. For, for example, uh, the CPRA defines health information quite broadly, data related to a consumer's health whereas other states like Virginia define it um, more narrowly to include medical diagnoses, right? Which may exclude some other things. Um, yeah, and so, even, and yeah. Do, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm a California lawyer, but I, I do think that it's likely that many states have specific uh, regulations related to the, the subsets of health information that are that we would require, we would consider sensitive. I mean, HIPAA, as I mentioned earlier, it's pre, HIPAA protects healthcare information the same, for the most part, the same whether, regardless of, of what that information is. If it's, if it's a, if, P, if it's PHI, it's PHI and you're restricted. But a lot of times the states will have different, um, more uh, strict regimes, I think. Cool. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. And like I said, we're gonna bring you back. We've got more discussion time at the end. And now we're gonna turn to our case studies to help sort of talk through some of those differences between um, between how different regulations might apply. But, but first, how should we understand how data is actually collected and how it's used? And we're gonna do that through a couple of case studies. So let me turn it to you first, Kate. Kate's gonna walk us through our first case study related to consumer health testing. Awesome. Thank you, Stacy. If you wanna go ahead and advance uh, to case study number one. As you can now uh, probably know from the last several years, at-home consumer testing has really skyrocketed and there's uh, several different ways that um, this has come to market. You're probably familiar with spit tests um, and the genetic tests that are associated with them, at-home blood testing kits. So you can now um, do an at-home blood test for all kinds of things from um, you know, just basic vitamin level tests to fertility tests. Um, as well as kind of aging and other wellness related information. And finally, things like microbiome tests where you can test either your stool or your stomach or even your skin to see you know, what is the, is the makeup of your microbiome. And I wanted to walk through these as a case study to really give you a sense of the various points at which sensitive health data may be collected or inferred or developed and what scenarios um, are much more kind of a gray space, so to speak. Um, so breaking down this business model kind of process by process. And so on the next slide, you'll see the first of, of two basic ways that this happens. And uh, apologies to everyone, I'm terrible with my slides. So uh, just pretend that uh, a kindergartner did this, but 
Um, in the first basic model, there's there's really three people or three entities who are um, working to develop and deliver this test kit and information set back to a person. So the individual uh, here on the left were to order a test kit from a likely online test service provider. Um, they may have visited a landing page that said, you know, find out your vitamin D levels. And so their, their geolocation as well as their IP address could be associated at a basic level with several different kinds of health conditions or health information. Whether or not that would be considered sensitive data is really varied based on state law. In California, I think you may have a strong argument that it's not, but um, in places like Virginia and Colorado, I'm sorry that it is, but in places like Virginia and Colorado, you know, that data is not necessarily being used to infer a diagnosis or a health condition. And so therefore it's less likely, I think, to be considered sensitive. From the e-commerce site, the individual would order the kit, the testing company would send them the physical kit to their house or, or their place of business. The individual would provide their bio sample. That bio sample, either spit or blood or skin, uh, whatever the case may be, would go to a third party lab for processing. The third party lab is likely a service provider of the testing organization, but most of the time these processing facilities are completely separate third parties. Sometimes they're subject to HIPAA, sometimes they aren't. It really just depends on the type of service. So in a scenario where this lab is subject to HIPAA, it could be that from that point forward, um, the, the data would be collected and processed under HIPAA in, in basic kind of raw data, um, returned back to the at-home testing kit center. And then that company would perform a whole host of processing activities. It would uh, get back the raw data. So it's not gonna see the bio sample at all, but it will see the raw data output. It may combine that with additional information that the person has provided to the site. So if uh, I'm a female, my age, and let's say I have a history of uh, you know, low vitamin D levels, specifically example, that could be combined with my, my blood test results. And they could interpret that test directly. So that would be an interpretation of what my vitamin levels are whether or not that's considered a health condition or diagnosis, again, um, I think would be an interesting point to analyze under the laws. And they could make also some additional inferences and um, predictions about my health and overall well being. For example, uh, an individual with chronically low vitamin D levels um, may have a whole host of other diagnoses or health conditions, um, and their machine learning algorithms could process some of that and predict that and indicate that I have, let's say, 45% chance of developing diabetes by the time I'm 90. Uh, that risk score and prediction is completely developed by their internal AI, may or may not reflect my actual health or well-being, but may be delivered back to me so that when all of this processing is done, I log into my account and I can see not only my raw test results, what my vitamin D levels are, as well as any sort of risk or predictions that the company has made about me. And I think what's interesting there is from that point forward, the process may really vary. The individual could continue to engage in that site, order more tests, provide more information. It could also upload or combine that test related information with third party data. Um, it could allow the sharing of its mobile device data with the, the testing company. So the testing company knows that, um, you know, I'm also a really great walker that takes 10,000 steps every day. Um, all of that is kind of used and, and combined internally, and it may be for the purpose of making health-related inferences or not, um, but most likely is not going to be used to predict any sort of health condition or diagnosis. On the next slide, you'll see a, a somewhat more complicated or um, kind of traditional flow for more uh, medically related at-home testing. This one uh, includes the additional provider network here on the right. And it's really a flow then between four entities. You'll have the same kind of flow where an individual visits the test company. Oh, sorry, it's a little bit hard. Sorry about that. Um, I'll try to speak into my mic a little more clearly. They, uh, they visit the test site, they order the test kit, they provide their sample, but for health regulatory purposes, there needs to be some sort of provider order for this test. So a doctor or another provider would receive a request from the testing company, review that, approve the, the order for that test, 
submits the order for the, to the lab so that the lab then knows that it's okay for them to go ahead and process that sample. The lab processes the sample. The sample results then will go back to the provider network. They'll review that raw data, approve um, that that raw data set um, looks, uh, looks and seems accurate, as well as providing any sort of initial uh, results or information and then send the data back to the home testing company. So the at-home testing company would receive the information from the provider network and do, again, all of that additional kind of analysis, information, and readouts. I think what's interesting here about this flow is more likely than not, this provider network is a HIPAA-covered entity. They're probably processing this sample through a HIPAA-covered lab. And so these two entities, depending on how they've set up these contractual arrangements, will likely then subject the at-home testing company to some level of either HIPAA or CMIA oversight. But I'd like to say that that's not always the case. Um, as, we, as we learned earlier from Rob, if the individual is just paying cash for all of these tests, this provider network, as well as a lab, may not be subject to HIPAA. And you can actually have a doctor order a test that you pay cash for, and that entity would never ever be subject to HIPAA. Um, so there's even more, I'd say, quote, traditional healthcare use cases that um, would still avoid HIPAA and may subject you to some of the state laws. Uh, again, all of the information I think would be provided back to the individual, combined at their will, and then they could share that, again, with other covered entities, non-covered entities, um, and throughout the, throughout the internet. I'd also note that, um, you know, in this follow-up that we talked a little bit about in terms of um, combining the information, providing additional risk scores and, and inferences based on that data, the individual may, um, you know, leave the website and then receive marketing or follow-up communications from the company that are considered advertising. And whether or not that individual is being targeted or at least um, inferences or profiles are being made about the individual's health, to offer follow-up testing or additional marketing or advertising, I think is a really interesting use case for uh, the fringe kind of third, second and third parties that may be affected uh, by the, the health and sensitive data provisions. I see there was a question about the provider network being a HIPAA covered entity. As I mentioned, in most cases, they probably are subject to HIPAA. But if the provider network is only receiving cash compensation and it's not submitting any electronic transactions, there are several provider networks out there that will continue to operate that way and are not going to be subject to HIPAA as a result. And then, Kate, are, are there particular relevant differences here between HIPAA and non-HIPAA covered entities in this flow that impact commercial use cases? I mean, for example, both, both HIPAA and many leading state laws both have a right to access information, but they might be different um, or, or any other relevant differences? Yeah, I mean, I think overall, uh, HIPAA is going to really focus around that care provision use case. So while the individual has right to access, they can expect that their data will only be shared with other entities that are involved in their care. So another healthcare provider, their billing and insurance agency, a laboratory, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's interesting about some of these state level laws if HIPAA is not involved is that, you know, those opt out and secondary uses are really start to be more limited um, in some ways. And so we may start to see that there are really heightened requirements around some of the non HIPAA covered um, health companies or at home testing companies. We'll pause here for just a second in case anyone wants to throw in another question for Kate. All right. All right, well, Kate, thank you so much. And we'll, again, we'll bring you back at the end for the discussion uh, a, a little bit more on some of those inferences. Um, let me turn it now over to you, Charlene. So you've got our, our second case study. You're going to talk us through a little bit of the data collection and data flows process in mobile apps that impact non-HIPAA health data. Yeah, thank you, Stacey. So building off of what Kate said and uh, all the things she mentioned about 
how to slice and dice different data flows to either be subject to HIPAA or not subject to HIPAA are equally applicable with respect to mobile apps. And in fact, um, the Health and Human Services Department issued guidance on um, mobile app development, particularly relating to health and identifying whether HIPAA was in, implicated or not. But for the purposes of this case study, I'm going to focus on kind of wellness, uh, fitness, and health related but non HIPAA subject data. And so the three kind of big topics I'll cover in this brief case study is how do we advise people, companies to think about mobile apps that may deal with, you know, fitness, wellness, health in general, but don't trigger or maybe do trigger. And at least if they do trigger the requirements of sensitive information or sensitive data under various laws, that the developer of the mobile app is prepared to comply with whatever requirements are associated with processing or collection of that data. So for example, what if the there's a mobile app that is relating to wellness for a particular ethnic group or a particular you know, grouping of individuals? So for example, you could elect, I'm not gonna name any names, but you can elect to put yourself or self-identify to a particular racial group um, or ethnic group or sexual orientation group um, by following topics, for example, of interest in a blog, for example, um, that you browse through a mobile app. That could possibly be sensitive data, and we'll go into a little bit more what that means and how you would determine that, but just think about the, the possibility that that could happen. Um, another type of mobile app category I wanted to focus on is what if there is a, a service that's directed towards but not exclusive to a particular group of users? Maybe it's a fitness app for a particular uh, racial group, for example, or a particular you know, group of you know, people that are of a particular social uh, sexual orientation. But it's not necessarily that you have to be in that group to use this service or this app. Um, and then the third point I wanted to make is mobile apps that don't process sensitive information on its face. For example, uh, if you have an e-commerce site, that's just kind of a general e-commerce site where you can buy clothes or you can buy shoes or you can buy whatever, but the use of big data analytics and artificial intelligence through inferences and through the way that AI machine learning takes input data, applies certain learnings to it and produces certain outputs, whether or not that in and of itself, the output could be deemed sensitive information or reveal sensitive information. So those are kind of the three themes that I wanna focus on um, in this case study. Uh, next slide, please. So with respect to sensitive data, I mean, this just for the purpose of the case study, I just wanna flag how the definition is very, very broad. And if you don't think through it carefully, you could run afoul of collecting sensitive information without really even realizing, for example, steps, workout logs, heart rate, when is it considered relating or concerning health? Um, quote unquote, sex life data, what does that include? Again, like if I um, opt into an interest group for LGBTQ, does that automatically indicate my sex life? Or is it just a purely an interest and may or may not be sensitive to me as an individual. Uh, philosophical beliefs, again, the different states and GDPR and probably other laws all have different inclusions of categories of what constitutes sensitive, but many times the subcategories within sensitive information are not defined. And again, can be kind of construed very, very broadly. And currently, at least with CPRA, the Virginia law and Colorado, we don't really have a lot of guidance on the parameters of those definitions. So if you, if you look at sort of the spectrum of sensitive, non-sensitive versus sensitive, um, there's you know, data that's clearly non-sensitive and low risk or clearly high risk or sensitive. But the reality is that most uh, data that we may collect may fall into either category based on the context or use and thus may differ uh, between covered entities. So for example, sensitive data might be um, when you use data for routine or non-sensitive purposes, but could be sensitive data by the nature of the type of the data that it is, or it could be non-sensitive data like shopping purchases or device usage, but that could be used to reveal, for example, I always buy um, 
you know, Advil on a certain day, or I, I, you know, buy these types of nutritional supplements. Um, and it could be not necessarily sensitive individually, but over time could essentially indicate uh, an inference or reveal information about my health uh, or other parts of, you know, myself that are deemed sensitive information under the law. Uh, next slide. So, so this slide, sorry, it's a little bit busy, but just wanted to kind of put these definitions here to dive into particularly the question that was asked earlier and some of the interesting features of, this is all from CPRA, but for example, the definition of personal information includes both inferences and separately sensitive information um, and whether or not an inference itself can, be con can constitute sep uh, sensitive information, I think is TBD, that, that's not entirely clear whether an inference on its independently can be deemed sensitive information, but um, the words that I've bolded and italicized here, like that reveals, I think that's really, really interesting um, to think about because whether or not something reveals someone's consumer's social identity, uh, social security number, precise geolocation, racial or ethnic origin, I think is a big question mark of what that means and the implications of what that means. And we don't, as I said, currently have guidance from the American regulator uh, in California, but the UK ICO has released guidance on what constitutes revealing special category of data. And according to them, um, the GDPR special category of data includes not only personal data that reveals specific details about a person, but also personal data revealing or concerning these details. And whether an inference constitutes special category of data depends on whether you're deliberately drawing that inference of a special category data point. So if you're specifically trying to draw someone's race out of data, for example, and how certain that inference is, i.e. if there's a reasonable degree of certainty that you can infer a particular characteristic that falls into the definition of sensitive or special category data, then that inference can in and of itself be sensitive. So anyways, I know we, I want to leave some time for questions, so I don't want to go into all the nuances of the law, but I've kind of just indicated in bold and italic some of the interesting things and some of the key words that I've found to be really, um, you know, important in nuancing how to think about sensitive information when it, when it comes to mobile apps or just more broadly. Thanks so much, Charlene. Um, and you mentioned briefly the UK ICOs and very interesting guidance on this exact question. Are you familiar with any other guidance out there that you would point folks to? Um, and I'll caveat that I'm I am not, so <laughs> I'm curious if you are. I haven't seen any other specific guidance from a regulator, but as we were talking about when we were preparing for this call, Stacey, the various DPAs in Europe have kind of taken divergent positions on this exact topic. For example, with the, the Grinder case and the Norwegian DPA's position on what constitutes sensitive information or, or special category data versus the um, Spanish DPA. So I believe that the topic is very much up for debate. And then furthermore, I will mention that some of my colleagues, for example, uh, Dominique Shelton Leipzig and Arsen Karinian have written articles in IAPP um, about the implications of this definition of sensitive information and potentially the inadvertent effect of reducing freedom to provide content affecting people of color or other marginalized groups because providers of the content may be afraid that it would be considered sensitive personal information just because of the fact that that content could quote unquote reveal someone's ethnic or racial identity and therefore not be willing to provide those targeted that targeted content for marginalized or disadvantaged groups. All right, thank you. I'll pause here for just a second in case there's anyone who wants to jump in the Q&A with a question. So there's a very specific hypothetical that I'll, I'll point your way, uh, Charlene and Kate if you, or, or Rob, if you have uh, thoughts on it. The specific hypothetical is, uh, if a company determines based on individual interests that user ID 123, is a country music lover, couch potato, age 50 to 60, likely to have diabetes, would this reveal a consumer's health? Is this sensitive data? 
I mean, partly depends on the law, but I think this is getting too, uh, if you had all of those other things, sorry, not, not the likelihood of diabetes, but if you had all of those other things, would that by itself potentially reveal a health condition? Edge case. I, I do think it depends. Um, I think there's a stronger argument that it's considered health and sensitive data in California. I think in Virginia and Colorado, the diagnosis piece is really important and I think lacking here. So um, I think in California, it's, it's not a given. I think it's up to an, a reasonable person to debate uh, the interpretation here. Um, but but um, the other two st states seem a little narrower in my opinion and obviously depends on the type of entity who's making these predictions, what other laws they're subject to, i.e. whether or not there's an exception in place um, and how the data is, is used. Okay. Yeah, I'll just jump in here just because I've done a little bit of research on this topic. Again, kind of the, the analogy or maybe helpful guidance, not de uh, determinative per se, but the UK's guidance that I just mentioned states, and this is a quote that it's likely to be a particular issue if you undertake any form of profiling, for example, that infers ethnicity, beliefs, politics, health risks, or relationship status. And if you intend to create such inferences, you're processing that special category of data, irrespective of the level of statistical confidence. So again, I think Stacy, to echo Stacy and Kate's point, whether this person is a country music lover, couch potato, age 50 to 60, and if that would reveal that that person has a likelihood of diabetes. And if that is sensitive information, I think depends on whether or not the entity collecting it had an intention of inferring and whether or not the inference links to a particular sensitive category. Not, and it doesn't really matter if the inference is accurate or not accurate. And I've, I've also heard this come up a lot where um, companies will ask, you know, well, what, what is an inference? I think depending on the nature of the company and the overall company's goals, it would be hard to argue that you're not purposefully making that inference for health related reasons. Um, if you are a health and wellness or biotech or consumer health company um, and have other processing activities related to the use of that. If, if you are a, a music streaming company and you may infer that they uh, are likely to have diabetes, I think the, the purposefulness is much different. Thanks for kicking us off with that first question. I'm going to stop sharing the screen now so that we it'll just be easier to see us and have a conversation. But like I mentioned earlier, we're going to have these available afterwards as well, and we'll we'll dig into some of some of the other questions for the next uh, 15 minutes. And I'll invite Sherry, please please join back in the conversation as well too. You're very 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 welcome. So, um, let's see. So since we were just talking about the ICO guidance and the term reveals, maybe I'll start with a question about that. Um, we have one attendee who says, with respect to that term reveals, what are the possible interpretations other than the interpretations of the ICO? Could, could you argue, or do, does anyone argue, that it includes any information that could be used to reveal sensitive information as opposed to when it is used for that purpose, which is more, I think, what you were arguing, Charlene. Um, do we have answers to this yet? Uh, I don't know, I'll just chime in here. I, I think that it's still very much uh, up in the air in the US at least. Uh, tough really to say. I mean, I think that with the regs, there will be more clarity but practically, if reveal is deemed to be the broadest possible interpretation, it may be an exception that swallows the rule where literally anything could be sensitive, especially because personal information is directly or indirectly identifying. So if you kind of bounce along the chain, um, you can at some point with all the computer power we have now probably reveal something about someone's health, for example, if you take the broadest possible interpretation someone's typing patterns, their mobile device usage, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, that would be the broadest possible definition. And uh, what, what, does anyone want to add to that? 
Sherry's looking thoughtful. Um, there's a there's a related question that I think kind of builds from this that I'll that I I kind of think Kate you may have some thoughts on, which is one person says why wouldn't we just assume that all data is sensitive? Um, why are we even making this distinction regarding sensitive data? Isn't it about preserving the ability of businesses to sell other data in unrestricted fashion, um, which may in fact be the the case under some some jurisdictions with the way laws are written, but but in more of a background sort of theoretical sense, why why are making this distinction uh, at all? We pose that existential one to you, Kate. Well, and you know, I think there's uh, many reasons as we discussed at the top of the hour, but um, I think there's a basic assumption that an individual may want more control or have heightened standards around certain types of information than they do around uh, others. And that's, I believe, a privacy norm that's been established in, in many jurisdictions and under the law for, for a long time. Um, you know, we've always, uh, in the US at least, really focused on those more sensitive data types in our regulations. So traditionally in the sectoral approach, HIPAA uh, covers health data and um, the GLBA covers financial data. And those two kind of sensitive data sets were really subject to many protections that normal data or non-sensitive data wasn't. So I think there's a balance in wanting to provide those levels of, of additional protection while still um, not hindering you know, the usability and the reasonable expectations of consumers to receive services and goods. Right. Does anyone want to add any other thoughts to that? I mean, I, I think that it's an interesting question. I would actually argue, or maybe not argue is too strong, but posit why wouldn't we just have all information just be personal information and have no sensitive information category at all? Because having the distinction is indicating that some kinds of information is more um, high value or, or needs to be protected more than other information. But as we've seen, when you actually, that sounds great in practice, I mean, principle, but in practice, when you actually think about it, it becomes very difficult. So does it really muddy the waters and make it harder for companies to comply with privacy laws with all of these um, distinctions that in some cases are actually quite arbitrary? Right, or, or, or certainly becoming more blurred through through the advancement of technologies like machine learning and AI that you were talking about. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, and Charlene, how would you characterize the GDPR? Would you characterize that as primarily applying to personal information with kind of a narrow piece on sensitive? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's, I think so. Um, I, I, in, you know, in my work, I have generally talked to, to clients about personal information and through the data mapping, we've tried to identify if there are any spe special category types of data. And then obviously when we do standard contractual clauses or any types of DPAs on the scope of processing, we'll have to identify their special category, but it's not the focus, I suppose, of the counseling because we kind of holistically approach a client's privacy compliance. But you know, with the definition in the CPRA, at least, and then potentially in the Virginia and Colorado laws, I think it's spurred uh, vigorous debate in the US just because we haven't really thought uh, or had to kind of parse the data in this way before. Yeah, lo lots of food for thought on that. Excellent, excellent question. Thank you to uh, the anonymous person who, who sent that one in. Um, we've got a couple of more really, really great questions in the Q&A, so I'm, I'm going to direct the next one to you, Rob, and I think you probably already know which one it is, <laughs> um, There's a, because it's about PHI and, and HIPAA. So the question is, is there anything in privacy laws, presumably HIPAA, CMIA, that prevents healthcare and life sciences companies from communicating directly with data subjects and financially or otherwise incentivizing them to share their PHI or sensitive PHI or non-PHI data provided they're fully transparent with what they plan to do with it. I, you know, I guess it, it's, it, I mean, I'd, I'd say you, you should, you're not supposed to do that, it, especially if the healthcare is coming, if the information is coming from a covered entity, if you're a covered entity, you're not supposed to market 
use that information to market directly to, 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 to the patient. Um, at least, I mean, that's kind of a general, general requirement. So yeah, I, it's not something that you're really, that you can do. There's also uh, for non potentially non HIPAA covered entities, um, the common rule that manages human subjects research um, and the oversight of, of um, data to create generalizable research. Um, there's no hard and fast prevention uh, of, of paying data subjects, but they, they do need to make sure that the financial incentive does not unduly um, influence the individual's decision whether or not they'd want to participate so that the consent to participate is freely given and, and not um, influenced. And, and I think under HIPAA, Rob, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you can obtain with full transparency, you can obtain authorization from a patient um, yeah, you can, uh, to market to, to, and if you have, if the covered entity has a financial interest in it, you know, you need to disclose that, but, but if a, yeah, the I mean, ability generally, to really, yeah. Generally, a patient, I mean, you, you actually, you'd have, generally, you'd have to disclose, if a patient asks you in writing to disclose information with your PHI to whoever they want you to, then yeah, you have to, you have to do that. Um, it's a kind of an underlying requirement. So yeah, so if the patient says, yes, Dr. X, I would like you to provide my information to this, this entity, then yeah, we have to do that. Right. And then the, I was just saying the covered entity could, um, could disclose, you know, I'd like to disclose this to entity XYZ. Um, do I have your authorization, written authorization to right. do that? But that's also permissible just to yep. clarify. Yep. Okay. Great. Great. So this one might be for you, Sherry. Do, do you imagine the new uh, California Privacy Protection Agency might expand the list of sensitive information, I, I understand CPRA gives them the ability to do that, correct? Yes, it does. I mean, I think it's already quite broad, frankly. Um, it's hard to imagine how they would, how they would go uh, broader than that. Um, hopefully, we will get a little bit more clarification on the issues that Charlene highlighted. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't think there's been any indication that they would go broader. Yeah. Uh, I, I, nor have I seen any indication, but of course they could. Um, and the, the point about political view or political affiliation is pretty interesting one because that's a big point of divergence. No, none of the US states currently regulate it directly, but it's considered special category data in the EU. So very interesting. Um, all right. Keep questions coming, folks. We've got another really interesting one around AI and machine learning. So many patients, I'll just read it. Sorry, it's a bit long, but I want people to, who are on the phone to be able to hear it as well. Many patients are having issues with how tech companies and hospitals are using data to build new AI and digital health companies. In other words, monetizing the data without really being transparent about how they're doing it. So monetizing, profiting from the use of the data, uh, are there legal protections for this specifically to opt out of this kind of thing? So not to be clear, not like sale disclosure, particular use, but monetization generally to build new tools, new services, new companies. Uh, are there legal protections to opt out of this? Uh, the justification being that they're paying for health services, not to have their data profited from. Good, yeah, totally understandable argument. Um, thoughts on the legal side of that question, folks? So under, under HIPAA, um, to be clear, there's not any sort of specific guidance on this topic. So it is something of a gray area. Um, generally speaking though, the, the guidance out of HHS has been that processing activities should be related to valid um, you know, data processing uses under HIPAA. So a lot of times covered entities or their business associates will make the argument that they are creating new AI or machine learning in order to improve their healthcare operations. Um, and I think if, if they are, and it's clear that that is a permissible use under HIPAA, 
um, then I think it would be hard to have a strong argument against it from an HHS kind of HIPAA enforcement perspective. That said, I think it gets incredibly murky very quickly. So the extent to which you're using PHI to develop other products or other services um, or, uh, you know, for, for any purpose unrelated to your operations or for the patient's treatment, I think um, that's quite more complicated um, and something that's, I think, legally a lot riskier. Mm -hmm. And I'll add a little bit to that. It, it, so in a lot of um, a lot of business associates for healthcare, whether it's plans or providers, usually it's plans, um, their business associates will include their business associate agreement that, that they can use, they can, they're allowed to de-identify the information and then use it. Um, plan, health plans, particularly employer sponsor, uh, self-funded plans may want to restrict that de-identification because that's exactly what it's being used for typically is, is that business associates going to aggregate that or use, use it for however they're, you know, whether to develop new apps or whatever it is, but they're going to use that. And then, you know, they'll somehow monetize that. So that's a consideration. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, the business associate can only use PHI as a covered entity um, can, or as allowed in the business associate agreement. In this case, you don't need to allow them to de-identify the information and then use it. And I guess yeah, to, to answer the question specifically in a, in the HIPAA world, there is no way to to opt out of that as long as it meets the legal requirements and it's either de-identified or for permissible use under HIPAA. There's no there's no opt out ability for patients. Patients, right? Yeah, and I'll I'll chime in from like a non HIPAA perspective. So with respect to health data that is not HIPAA subject. The, currently, there is no uniform AI transparency requirement in the United States. There have been many bills that, including at the federal and various state levels. For example, the federal at the federal level, there was a bill called the Algorithmic Accountability Act that did not go anywhere, but it, it required disclosure of things like, you know, use of certain types of data, such as health data, for AI purposes, AI training for uh, modeling purposes and provided um, audit rights and kind of like a data protection impact assessment, but it was the same kind of impact assessment, but for AI. So currently without that type of either federal or state protection, we're governed by the patchwork of laws that generally govern privacy. Like for example, under FTC um, regulations, you would still, I think, want to be transparent as a company on how you use AI. And in fact, the FTC has had a number of symposiums and guidance on use of big data and sort of best rules of the road, although it's not, you know, quote unquote law per se. You know, I think what what we've done at, at Perkins is we've, we've done some kind of studies where we've evaluated how different tech companies have approached transparency and what that means and whether or not the opt-out is voluntarily provided, even if not required by law, and how they can actually practically do that given the way that AI works, because generally speaking, when you're talking about AI, you're having vast volumes of data. So if someone opts out, depending on what point they opt out, it may not actually be possible to extract their data from the model once it, the data has been used to train the model. So practically, it may not even be a possibility, even if the company were to want to do it. But kind of going back to my earlier point about the survey, we found different companies approach it differently. Some we know use AI, but don't say anything about it. Some disclose AI, but kind of do it in like one sentence, say something like we use your data to improve our algorithms or for automated decision-making. And some are really detailed and actually go into um, specificity about how their AI is trained and what specific data is used to train the AI. So it kind of varies and is a little bit mixed right now. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point too. There's a there's a, a big deceptiveness claim potential claim here. I think so. If a reasonable consumer of a product wouldn't um, assume or know or think that their data would be used in those secondary purposes, I do think we'll see some enforcement action and activity in that space. And the FTC has, you know, they have required companies in a different context, not with health data, but facial recognition data. If, if it's been improper, you know, collected for one purpose and used specifically for big data purposes, they've said, okay, you're going to have to throw that algorithm out basically because um, it was based on improperly obtained data. 
And I think just coupling that with the very specific um, and informed consent required under CPRA and the and the other laws of Virginia and Colorado, it just seems to me transparency is going to be absolutely required for non-HIPAA data um, with respect to these types of uses. I think that is a fantastic place to end and wrap up. Um, so I will just say thank you so much to all of our excellent speakers, Charlene, Kate, Rob, Sherry. Thank you so much. And for folks who are listening, we will see you again next week, we hope. Please go to fpf.org slash events to register. Next week, same time, same place, you can join us for an educational webinar on online advertising. We're going to talk about cookies and advertising IDs, and I'm particularly excited about it. One of our guest speakers actually has a, a PhD in programmatic advertising um, and is a technological expert, and, and one is a business expert. So very excited about that, and um, you can register for it online. Sherry, any other? No, just thank words? you so much for attending, and um, yeah, just come next week. I think for all, all many lawyers who don't know uh, about this digital advertising, the mechanics, the terms, and, and now's the time to uh, get up to speed with it all. So, all right. Thank, thank you, you very much. Have a great weekend. Okay. Bye-bye.